Good morning, church. God is good all the time. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. So I don't know if you know this or not, but you are participating in something amazing that's happening. I should look around the room. Just look around. Look at the amazing faces that God has brought into this room today. <laughs> Always got to be a funny one, right? There is a beautiful thing happening in this room. And God's spirit is moving here. And he's changing lives and he's changing circumstances and he's reuniting families. It is incredible. Amen. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. Are you? Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. So um, I came across this picture the other day. This is not a hurricane victim. This was actually built like this in a place called Poland. Y'all heard of Poland before, right? So in Poland, this house was built to represent the way that communism flipped everything upside down in that country. This house essentially is a fully furnished home, but as the builders were building it, when they built it just like this. As they were building it, they had to stop several times construction because they're, they were so disoriented by having to build it this way. They're, you build a house up right side up right? And so this threw them completely off and they were completely disoriented and had to stop work multiple times in order to, to finally get back into the place where they could finish this house, right? And so what you do to go in this house, they open it up for tours. You have to go in the attic window to get in and then you essentially walk on the ceiling to see everything inside the house. It's kind of weird, right? I don't know about you, but I find it really disorienting. The world becomes really disoriented when things are upside down. Amen? Here's another look at something that I found really fascinating this week. This is a botanical garden in Alaska. And I don't know if you noticed, but these are roots. These are the roots of a tree that are sticking up and are housing flowers, right? Now, the story behind this, it's called the Flowering Garden, the Flowering Towers. And the story behind this is that this guy who owned the, the, the meadow where this was being built, the guy was angry one day because his machine was caught. And so he grabbed this old tree, flipped it upside down, stuck it in the mud. And when he saw the roots, it inspired him to do the same with some other trees that had come down. And he built this upside down group of trees that now become what's called the flower tower. It's kind of cool, right? But it's a little weird. It's a little weird because when things are upside down, it's a little weird. Amen. I look at my life sometimes and I think to myself, man, things are just a little bit crazy. Ever? How many of you ever felt like things were just a little bit upside down in your life? Yeah. Like we live in a world where down is up and up is down, like nothing is as it seems and things aren't exactly the way you think they should be. I know that describes most of us in this room, right? I feel that all the time. I mean, if you take a grand glance at the world around us, it's really quick to see that things are not as they should be. Let me give you some examples. First of all, nearly nine, listen to this, nine million people last year died of hunger. In a world where we have more than enough food to feed every single person every single day in an adequate way, 9 million people died of hunger last year. That's upside down. Amen? In a world where, where peace, we know that when peace is working, things are good, more than 8 million people just in the United States were victims of violent crimes last year. That's upside down. Right? Right? 108,000 people, we know this crowd really well, 108,000 people in the United States died of an overdose last year in a country that is has abundant treatment and post-treatment resources. That is upside down. Amen? 
Sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes the world seems to me to be a little bit upside down. Evil has invaded our world, and because it has, things are upside down. What if the solution is upside down too? What if the solution to the problem of evil in the world that we live in is upside down? What if by doing the opposite of what we are naturally compelled to do, we will overcome evil and the things of God will ultimately win out? According to Paul, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. Romans chapter 12, verse 21, the very end of Romans chapter 12, he says this, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Turn to your neighbor and say, we need to see a little good. Yeah. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You probably know this already, but it's natural to give in when the storms of life are beating up against us. Amen. It's natural to give ourselves whatever we want, even if it might bring harm to somebody else or to ourselves. It's natural to take matters into our own hands when things aren't doing what they want them, what we want them to do. It's natural to allow our emotions and our affections and our frustrations to drive our response to the world around us. It is natural to let evil win. Amen? That's what's natural. This is the way the world lives. It's the easier way, right? It's the way that brings the most immediate satisfaction. It's how we are wired to think and to live as people of a broken world. But it's not God's way. Amen? That isn't God's way. God's way, the kingdom way, is a whole lot different than that. He didn't come so that we'd live like that. He came with grace and mercy so that we would live in a whole different way. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. As we wrap up this series on good versus evil, I want to talk about the power of doing good to change all that is evil in the world around us. Amen? And so I want to take a moment and I just want you to close your eyes with me and take a deep breath. And Father, as we get ready to hear what you have to speak to us, I pray that you would penetrate every single heart in this room. That your spirit would move in mighty ways. That you would compel us to live differently than we are already living, to move in a direction you want us to move. And that God, we would leave here changed by what you're about to speak to us. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 12 this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Romans 12. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, I want to make sure that you stop over to our bookshelf before you leave. Grab a Bible off the shelf. If you don't have one at home and you need it, that is yours, our gift to you. We just ask you to take it home, read it, and do what it says. Some of you are probably tired of hearing that. Too bad. Because here's the thing, that's the only thing that changes the world. Amen? We're in Romans chapter 12. Now I'm going to summarize the first 11 chapters in about three minutes here. Are you ready for this? So Romans, Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome, and he basically says to them this. He says, look, the world is screwed up. Somebody say amen. amen. The world is upside down from the way I meant it to be. And because it is, lots of sin rules, rules the planet, right? I mean, you and I are sinners, every single one of us. Somebody say amen. You don't like hearing that, but it's true. You're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. We're all sinners, and we all fall short of God's standard for us. And the truth is that the punishment that we deserve is death. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. What a great word. I'm just telling you what Romans says. Amen. The punishment we deserve is death. So Paul drops this bomb in the first few chapters and we're wrestling with this. And we're like, man, that's really hard to hear. But the truth of the matter is there's more to this story because Paul bursts on the scene with some good news. Amen. And the good news that he bursts on the scene with is this, that while we were still in our sin, while we were still enemies of God, Jesus died for us. Jesus stepped in and he said, I'm going to pay the penalty for their sin. 
I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, he paid the penalty for you. If somebody didn't point at you, I'm going to point at you now. He paid the penalty for you. Jesus died so that you could have life. Amen? He paid the penalty for you that God saved you when you said yes to the gift that he offered us in Jesus. His grace and his mercy made all of that possible. Right? So he teaches all of this in the first 11 chapters. And then in chapter 12, he says, since all of this is true, since God has paid the price for your life, then I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God says, look, I got this plan because of my grace, because of my mercy. You don't need to live the way that you're compelled to live in the natural. I want to transform the way you think, and I want to transform the way you live, right? And so what does that look like? What does it look like to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Well, it looks like not living like the world lives, amen? The world, I don't know if you knew this about the world, but the world is selfish, and the world is greedy, and the world is lust-filled, and the world is hungry for all of the wrong things. The world prefers all kinds of things above God. The world is essentially evil. Man, and into that world, God thrusts his army. Y'all know who his army is, don't you? Raise your hand if you're part of the army of God. Yeah, if you're following Jesus, if you've said yes to his wonderful grace, you are part of the army of God. And you have been placed on this planet by, so that the commander-in-chief, Jesus himself, could totally turn your life upside down, Right? So that the mission that he sets you on to overcome evil could be accomplished so that we can learn to prefer God over everything else. And at the end of Romans 12, Paul says we overcome evil with good. With good. We talked a little bit about what good was a couple weeks ago, but what I want you to get is that Paul in Romans chapter 12 at verse 21 tells us that we overcome evil with good, but he spent the first, the few verses right before that telling us what good looks like. And so we're going to look at that together, starting at verse 14. This is what he says. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Let me repeat that. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Man. And as long as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If, uh, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, listen to this. If your enemy, If your enemy is hungry feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Y'all cheered about that part. <laughs> oh, I got bad news for you. <laughs> We're going to come back to that in just a minute. And then he finishes up in verse 21 and he says, do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Those eight verses seem absolutely crazy to me. How about you? I mean, really, let's be honest. Where do you see this happening in the world? Right? I mean, I'm cursing people who curse me. Just be honest. Come on now. I'm ready to get back at the people who hurt me. That's the way I'm wired. That's the way you're wired. Naturally, this is how we behave. This is the kind of thing that we do. Right? Right? But Paul's saying, listen, when this upside down passage, Paul is saying there are some really unconventional ways that we're going to wage war against evil, and it's only possible by the transformation of your mind. You're not going to be able to do this in the natural. You're not going to be able to do the good things that Paul is about to tell us to do if you aren't transformed in your mind. Amen? Amen. Because your mind tells you, get back at the person who hurt you. Your mind tells you, curse the person who curses you. Your mind says, you know what? That person who hurt me, well, they're on their own. 
And Paul says, that's not how it's supposed to work, right? You and I cannot and will not do what Paul instructs in the verses that we just read unless God has changed the way we think, right? Because this is not a natural way of living. And so the world changes. Evil is subdued when we allow God's mercy and God's grace to change us, to guide us, and then to pour out of us into a world that is lost and broken. It starts in us, right? And so Paul says, look, we're going to overcome evil. We got to do it by doing good. Where does it, what does that look like? It starts with this. He says, you got to bless those. Somebody say, bless those who persecute you. How many of you have heard that word persecution before? In this word, in this community, in this culture, we have one definition, one idea of what persecution looks like, because I don't think any of us have really experienced real persecution, right? I mean, I don't like it to be mocked. I don't like to be mocked for my faith. I don't like it that people get fired from their jobs because they lead a prayer, a voluntary prayer before a football game. I don't like the idea that a bank would shut down an account of a, of a, of a nonprofit that's helping immigrants because they don't want to support those immigrants. I don't like that. And it's a little bit of persecution, but it's nothing like Paul's readers would have understood. See, to be persecuted in Paul's day could lead to death. Their lives were actually on the line every time they spoke or lived for Jesus. Amen? Their lives were on the line every single time. Stephen was stoned to death because of what he believed. Thankfully, laws have been put into place in the United States and other places in Western culture to prevent certain levels of persecution, so we don't really experience it the way the ancient cultures did. Or even some of those countries around the world where Christianity isn't legal, right? See, death is still happening today, and that's a horrible form of persecution, and that's the kind of thing that Paul was addressing. He went to them and he said, hey, as bad as it seems, I want you to bless those who are persecuting you. In other words, bless the people who are threatening to kill you. (laughs) It's very quiet in this room right now. Yeah, this is hard to hear. That we're called, as hard as this is, to bless the people who have the worst intentions for us. Jesus says it like this. He says, look, if you're hit on on one side, turn over so they can hit you on the other. Right? (laughs) He says, listen, listen, if they hurt you, pray for them. Jesus says, he says, listen, if they give you something to carry that's heavy for a mile, carry it two miles. That's what I want you to do to be a blessing to the people around you. That's what it means to bless. It's the idea that this this thing that God has done for you has been done for you, so you better go do it for somebody else. No matter what they've done to you. So Paul says, be good to those who hurt you. The utter shock of that statement is mind-blowing, amen? We don't want to deal with that. It's one of the most revolutionary statements in the Bible, but that's the call. That's the job. If you are a follower of Jesus, If you are walking on this planet and have said yes to Jesus, then you are called to overcome evil by blessing those who persecute you. Then he goes on, he says, I want you to empathize with people in their praise and in their pain. On the surface, that one sounds pretty easy. I'm going to sit with people who are hurting. I'm going to sit with people who are celebrating. I like that. It sounds pretty good. Except Paul didn't, didn't add any sort of qualifier here, right? When Paul says this, he's talking about not just the people that we love and that we know, but you're going to sit with people and praise with them and mourn with them, even if you don't like them. Who wants to do that? Raise your hand if you want to do it. (laughs) So I got some people that raised their hands. They maybe could teach this lesson a little better than I could. Because I don't want to do that. I don't want to praise with the people who've hurt me. I don't want to mourn with the people who've hurt me. I want them to suffer. I'm just saying, that's who I am in the natural. That's what I'm naturally wired to do. It becomes really complicated when we're asked to walk with somebody who's hurt us. But listen, 
Nothing changes somebody's mind about Jesus and nothing changes somebody's mind about you faster than how you celebrate with them when they win and how you suffer with them when they hurt. Amen? It's why Paul is so adamant about this. If you want to move the needle of people's perspective about God, which is our mission on this planet, then you better do what's good in the face of evil. Amen? And that means you got to empathize. you got to walk with people who you don't always want to walk with. Then he goes on and he says, you got to show humility. Not only do you have to show humility, but you actually have to be humble. You know, there's a difference, right? We can put on, put on a mask of humility and we'll get caught at some point. Amen. Or we can be humble, which is what the call really is. Jesus says, if you're going to be able to bless and if you're going to be able to empathize, then you got to get this right first. You better get past your own preconceived notions and you better, as Paul says to the Philippians, value others above yourself. And this is hard. And here's why it's hard. Because the world I live in and the world you live in tries to teach us that it's about me. It encourages me to go get mine first. Amen? Amen. It encourages me to take care of me and my own, to watch out for my best interest. How many of you know the gospel is never about that? Did you know that? Now, we're, we're taught all kinds of crazy things about the gospel in this culture, but here's what the gospel actually says. Jesus says, listen, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. He goes on and he says, the greatest among you is going to be your servant. The emphasis is always on others first. I want you to imagine for a moment that your enemy saw you sacrificing for their benefit. Imagine you taking their punishment on you. Imagine deciding to pass on an opportunity so that what you for, for something that you needed so that they could experience something good. What happens? All of a sudden, there's this good chance that at some point, your enemy sees your selflessness and says, who does stuff like that? I mean, I want people to say that about me. I, I long for people to say, this crazy guy would go so far as to suffer so that I didn't have to. Not so I get celebrated, but so that he does. Amen? That ought to be our goal. And that's what he's calling us to. There's a chance if you become humble, that you'll get to a place where you will win somebody over because of your selflessness and your humility. And if you don't, then you've been obedient to Jesus' call on your life. Amen? And so, evil can't stand when you decide to live in humility. Now, Paul goes forward and he says, avoid retaliation. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Remember that coal heaping you guys wanted to do before? You all got excited about the coal. I heard some amens when I said, you heap hot coals on their head. Y'all like, amen. <laughs> what I want you to hear this morning, church, is that it's not about that. Right? We do the things that we do because God's called us to, not because it's going to heap coals on somebody else's head. Amen? We don't repay evil for evil. Right? Right? We don't let somebody else's evil determine our response. Paul pushes this thought even further. He says, don't take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath, for vengeance is mine. Against every desire you have to get back at the person who's hurt you, Paul is pushing you to choose something else instead. Pray for those who hurt you instead of hurting them. That is revolutionary. It's upside down. Amen? Then he plows ahead and he says, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Now, guys, we like peace. Somebody say amen if you like peace. I like living in peace. I like walking with other people in peace in my life. And the problem is I also don't like conflict. Raise your hand if you like conflict. If you like it. Nobody likes it. All right, maybe a few of you like it, right? The truth is I don't like conflict, and I would rather just avoid it. How many of you know that a peacekeeper will sometimes avoid conflict? Here's what also happens, though, when you keep the peace. You also keep injustice, and you also keep pain, and you also keep hatred rolling when you decide that you're just going to keep the peace despite whatever else is going on. We're not called to keep the peace, church. We're called to make peace. And sometimes making peace causes conflict. Amen? 
Now it's for the good of the kingdom and it's for the good of your relationships for you to make peace, but it's not comfortable and it's going to bring conflict. But ultimately that's what Paul's calling us to do. Walk as a peacemaker. How many of you know it's not always possible to make peace? There are times where people in your life will not allow that to happen, or there are times maybe that it's inappropriate for you to be in that relationship again. What do you do in that place? You bless them and you don't curse them. You avoid retaliating against them. You empathize with people in their pain. You decide that you're going to walk humbly, right? That's upside down. Paul is given all these difficult upside down directions up to this point, And then he finally finishes it off by saying, you give your enemy what he needs and not what he deserves. How many of you got what you needed from God and not what you deserved? Every hand in this room ought to go up. Because if you got what you deserved, we'd all be in a lot of trouble. Amen. When you look at the people in your life that you see as enemies and adversaries, when you think of what they deserve, let's just be honest. Sometimes we've been calculating for years how we could get back at them. I've plotted and I've planned and I've come up with this idea about how I'm going to fix this wrong that they, that they exacted against me, right? And Paul says, look, man, that's not how this works. If you want to overcome evil, then you got to do good. And here's how you do good. If your enemy is hungry, then you feed them. If, you're, if they're thirsty, then you give them something to drink. And when you do that, you heap burning coals. Not for the sake of heaping burning coals, which sounds like a lot of fun. You know what you're doing when you're heaping burning coals is you're punishing them. And that's not yours to do. God called you to feed them if they're hungry and to give them to drink if they're thirsty. He'll take care of the burning coals. Man, all of this is so upside down. It's so upside down. This is not how the world works. Amen. Y'all walk in this world with me. You know, this is not how the world operates. The world wants to do all of the opposite things of what we just, what we just described Paul's is telling us to do. But church, you're not of this world. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're not of this world. You're just in it which makes you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven living in a foreign land. Amen? So if you're walking on this planet and you're part of this army, you're a part of the army of God and you've called to invade a place that is foreign and hostile to you. And God says, listen, here's how my army works. I want you to give love away. I want you to be so generous to people that they don't even know what to do. I want you to feed people when they're hungry and not despise them. I want you to bless them when they persecute you. That's what I want my army to do because my army is going to overcome evil by doing good. Amen? And in order to get there, we have to start thinking in upside down ways and we have to start living in upside down ways. I'm going to invite the band to come up and they're going to close us in one more song. And as they closed this morning, last night at Overcomers, we were talking about a passage out of Deuteronomy 30 where Moses said, look, you've got two choices. You can decide to live. You could decide to die. Now we say we don't want to die. We don't decide to die. We don't ever make the decision just to die. Very rarely do we do that. Except every moment of every day when we decide to live our own way, to do what's comfortable for us, to prefer anything above God, we are deciding to die. That's the decision that we make. We're walking in the evil of the world when we decide to do those things. Moses says there's another way. Jesus says there's another way. I came so that you can have life and have it abundantly. But in order to do that, you have to follow me. You have to live the way I live. You have to do the things I do. It's upside down. Somebody in your life, in the last 20 minutes, you've been thinking about somebody in your life who's, who you've called an enemy for a long time. 
maybe they abused you. Maybe they ruined your reputation. Maybe they did things that got them ahead and they didn't care about anybody around them and it made you just so angry and you can't stand the thought of them. Whatever it was, there's somebody who entered your mind and your heart when this message started today. And I want you to reframe for just a second what it would look like to live out this passage that Paul just walked us through. What would it look like in their life to bless them instead of persecute them? What would happen if you decided today, you know what, I think instead of retaliating, I'm going to forgive them. What would it look like today if I, I don't, I don't even know if it's possible in your situation, but what would it look like today if I just decided to reach out and make peace? What if I loved them instead of hated them? You want to overcome evil. This is what it looks like. Jesus didn't promise easy, <laughs> but he did promise rewarding. And if you do this, not only will it change your life, but it'll change the hearts and the lives of the people that you thought were your enemy. I'm going to ask Stan and Chelsea to go stand by the black curtain. As we close in this last song, here's what I want you to do. If there's somebody in this room who just needs, you just need to let go. I want you to go see them and they're going to pray with you. If you heard this message today and you're like, I want to be a part of this army that's, that's doing good instead of evil, but I'm not there yet and I don't know how to get there, I want you to go see Stan and Chelsea and they're going to pray for you. Today is the day it begins. The revolution starts right here. As we live upside down lives, communities are going to change, families are going to change for generations. It all begins right here. Stand with me and let's sing. And if you need prayer, go see my friends.